me now is Steve Baines, who is the CEO founder of Forcivity. And Forcivity has just ended up on the Inc. 5000 list, which is a huge place to be when you're really in business three years. Is it Steve at this point? Uh, technically four. Four. Yes. But 2,400% growth in revenue over that period of time, which is just Correct. an amazing thing. So I'm happy to have an opportunity to have a conversation with you. There are so many things going on these days because of restrictions, quarantine, and the transition overnight. And I always talk about it as the gatekeepers have fallen. And suddenly, what might have taken 10 years to get schools to make changes, businesses to adopt technologies, has overnight been creating for you guys an opportunity unparalleled before. Sure. So share a little bit about what Forcivity does. I know what you do, and I understand complex integrations. But apply this to the COVID-19 crisis that we have. Your business, I come from 30 years of sales, and now yeah. nothing, you know, you can't visit people. There are no doorways. So if you haven't done some of the groundwork that Salesforce helps create, right. it's a much harder place to get started. But give us some background, please. Well, you know, companies like Salesforce, they've been around for 20 years and they really pioneered cloud computing. You and I are both old enough to know that cloud computing is just the latest iteration of things like application service providers and things like that. It's, you know, it's the same thing with a different name, right? At the end of the day, you're using somebody else's computer. Uh, it's just not your own. So fortunately, you know, our business is based on, revolves around Salesforce, anything to do with Salesforce. And with suddenly everybody having to be remote, forced to be remote, having a distributed workforce as well as distributed technology has been key to making at least parts of this economy continue to work. We're a great example. You know, we ourselves use Salesforce to run our business, but we are so reliant on all of these cloud technologies to interact with our clients even before COVID. Uh, as I sit here in my office today, it's, it's sparsely populated. Not everybody's back. Um, you know, when we had to, when we were forced to leave because of the, um, uh, the lockdown, we in essence continued to do what we were doing just in a different spot. So we fortunately had become very good at working with everybody remotely. Um, so it was, we were very accustomed to that, very comfortable with that. Our biggest challenge was actually working with each other and figuring out how to reinvent how we actually did business with each other, scheduling meetings, you know, what used to be a two minute stand up and look over my desk and ask somebody a question is now a scheduled Zoom, 30 minutes and hey, you're not available till Thursday and it's Monday type of thing. So we had to really rethink about how we did all of that. But you know, back to your original question about the Salesforce as a whole, what we're finding is that companies are still trying to move forward. They still need to do business. They're still buying software. They're still making decisions. And at the heart of it for us is Salesforce. There's, they still need folks like us to consult and advise and say, okay, here's how you should think about this. And, you know, here's how we can help. COVID has just added another layer to that. And it's, it's been challenging because they don't teach this in school. So we've been really learning as we've been going. But the reality is, is that we are now talking to people from their living rooms rather than everybody sitting in a conference room. They're, they're having their own challenges. I, I said it many times in some of our all hands, meet, all hands meetings. It's like, just remember that our customers are going through this too. So they're struggling. They're struggling to keep business. They're struggling to interact. So be aware of that. Be sensitive to that. Um, just like we're dealing with those types of dynamics. Um, and it was, it, w it was good to remind ourselves of that uh, on a constant basis where every time we were interacting with them and understanding that decisions that used to take days were now taking weeks. And honestly, customer payments that used to show up on time, you know, like clockwork were suddenly days and weeks late, you know, it, just, it had an overall effect on every part of our business. So we had to re really rethink every avenue of how we did business. And it's true, I think it affects, you know, you hear the term, we're all in this together, and it's true as we're going through it, no one has been in a pandemic of this magnitude right. before. Yeah. And you're typical of a business that's starting out and doing things, you've just moved into new quarters and then had the place shut down. Yeah, so, literally, you know, literally within weeks. weeks. So yep. when you look at that, but yet the underlying principle behind SaaS and everything else that goes on is it's seamless because whether you were in an office or you're working remote or you're working even with a, a smartphone, an Android or an iPhone from a distance, the way we have started to change doing business has, has moved and progressed in enough different places. 
to give you a serious business to integrate. And while you yeah. offer solutions, what I would like to have you explore, looking at the website and things, because you talk about solutions, building, engaging, Salesforce solutions and communities. Yep. And I'm a community focused advocate these days. So mm -hmm. I got excited when I saw that <laughs> because I understand what you mean, what I think you mean by it. Right. But as any good person in communication learns, tell me what you actually intended that to do. Because I think it's a very important pivot point for your success and for the success yeah. of the companies you helped. It has, and you know, and, and our track record, fortunately, has proven that. I mean, we we've built a business around community. The way that we look at it is, every business is a three-legged stool: employees, customers, and partners. Uh, you know, it's that that's really what makes businesses run. Obviously, you know, you need customers to be successful, and you need employees to produce whatever it is that your customers are interested in. But what's equally as important is the partners that you engage with as well. And partners can take all different kinds of shapes: technology partners. Uh, I mean, our landlord is a partner, you know, there's somebody that we depend on. So when we're a partner of theirs. So when we look at that uh, in the context of Salesforce and communities, what we do is because we, you know, have got such deep expertise across the entire platform and Salesforce has given us such great tools. We now spend a lot of time working with our customers to find ways to extend their own business out to their customers and out to their partners. Uh, you know, at the end of the day, you know, customers want to see their data. They want to touch and feel it, and they want to understand where things are at. And they just, they just want it to be easy to do business with the people that they buy products and services from. Uh, and what Salesforce does is it has given us this incredibly powerful platform to build those experiences without really a lot of code. You know, it, it's, it's literally like a no-code, low-code type of solution where we can sit down and just point and click, as we kind of jokingly say, and we suddenly get this incredible user experience that we just built in a matter of days rather than weeks and months and hundreds of thousands of dollars. So when we talk about community, it's really about using Salesforce to extend beyond the boundaries of just an employee sitting down and logging in and looking at their leads or looking at their accounts and contacts. It's okay, how am I interacting with my customers right from this spot that I work on every day? Now, I'm still logging into Salesforce. I can still interact with my customer on this unified platform even though they're someplace out in the world, I don't care where they are. They're accessing my community that I've built for them and I can talk to them just like they're sitting right next to me. Right. Now, when you say built the community for them, give me, let, we could use an example, media company. Mm -hmm. I'm a media company involved in a traditional news print it was a print only kind of world. We're all mm -hmm. getting news feeds rapidly. Manchester Inklink is an online publication, 100% digital. There is no mm -hmm. print involved in it. There right. are virtual Inklink partners, people who help support what's going on. There mm -hmm. are advertisers in the traditional sense, people who want to be found. And there are transitions from traditional story, you know, what's news, what's a journalist's role these days? Is it to build right. community? Is it to expose untruths, falsities? There's a lot of mm -hmm. that out there, you know? And so media is under attack in general. But I like to think that my joining this particular organization is to help them talk about me because there are new rules of how we should communicate, how we do business. So what yeah, do you and, tell and a salesperson in terms of building that community? What does it represent? Structure? Good question. Yeah, it could, it's a good question. And for us, it represents a couple different things. And because, it, it, you know, Salesforce operates in, uh, you know, kind of certain buckets as far as how they t talk about things and how they go to market with things. When they talk about community, they typically have some very specific purposes for the community. You know, generally speaking, when somebody says, you know, I just built an online community, they're thinking about members logging in and their profiles and gamification and, and chatting with one another. Facebook. Facebook is a community. That's what it is. So, you know, social networking, that term kind of sticks with reality. It's a community of people. They like it, like uh, interests. You know, they chat about certain things. They have the ability to join groups and leave groups. Uh, indicate um, approval for things. So Salesforce has very similar capabilities where you can build that user to user, peer to peer type of interaction. And you know, our customers have the latitude to choose how involved or how observant they are of that. So they can choose to participate, could watch, could moderate, uh, you know, they can really get involved. They can look for their customers to be asking questions about certain things about their product or service offering and they could chime in with a response. Um, so they have that latitude to really dictate 
you know, how interactive is that community? On the flip side, you know, the other way that Salesforce looks at communities is very transactional, self-help, self-service. Like you can come here and help yourself. You can read our knowledge base or you can log a support ticket and somebody will help you or you can chat with an agent. So very transactional, very siloed in the functionality. Or you could combine all that together and just under one big umbrella and just have it can be this complete user experience where your partners, your employees and your customers can all, you know, commune right there in that same digital property. It's a powerful set of tools. I guess I want to try to even pull it down one more step away from the technology into the human to human interaction side of it. Because yep. the key for people who don't understand it, and, and I'm trying to build community by translating across cultures and generations. That's mm -hmm. become my mission after I left my corporate world. Yep. And so to the lay person who is not familiar with this, you know, you're doing more sophisticated integrations, bigger companies, a lot more money to do it. But at the most elementary level, that ability to interact or let it be self-serve mm -hmm. is another, another one of those points that I think provides an entrance for new people to the world of this type of data, communication, gathering, efficiency, automation. And yet, there's still a human touch. There is. And, I, you know, I failed to mention that. Salesforce, the company in and of itself, is really the pioneer in building strong customer communities. And I'll give an example. So they have their own community platform that us as users and partners can participate in. And it's, it's, a, it's a phenomenal dynamic because it's, it's generally used, they call it the success community. So everything around, in a, around them focuses on customer success. They're a SaaS-based business, so they are dependent on you renewing your contract. And what, you know, what leads customers to tend to renew is if they're happy with the software that they're using. So they have created tools to enable that happiness, to allow users to help themselves, but also to lean on other people. So this community that they've built that is now millions of users strong, it's, a, it's incredibly powerful what you can do. So if you, let's say you have a question about how to do something in Salesforce, or you have a problem, you can go to this community and ask the community, hey, I'm stuck on this. Has anybody run into this scenario before? Uh, most times, 99 times out of 100, somebody has responded to that question within minutes, sometimes within seconds. There's just this vigor, this desire for people in this community to help other people. It's an amazing dynamic. So it's oftentimes when even people here are stuck, I'm like, go to the community, go ask the community and see what they have to say. And that, so it, yeah. Yeah, I was going to say that's important because we all have been part of some of this online social communities where all of the answers are online mm -hmm. and, the and the forum for question and answers, things are left on You know, there, I don't want to mention any names because there are some really bad offenders, but you go in, you ask a community question, it's not answered. You ask the company for support and there, you know, it's, it's crickets. There's not a sound coming out of them. So we help each other and you walk away grumbling that that's not the best social media tool. This is a very different world. This is, is a Sharing expertise is what I'm hearing. It is, it very much is. And this one is completely user moderated. So Salesforce doesn't participate in this at all. Uh, it's really meant to be peer to peer, users helping users. Um, and some are beyond helpful. I mean, they're incredible. It's so much time. I can't even and that's imagine. That's the power that. of connection. That is the power of connection when you do that. that absolutely, absolutely. Anything's and, and done. Yeah, and you see a lot of tech companies trying to emulate this. I mean, Salesforce, again, was really at the forefront of leading through this and saying, this is how you do it. And there's a lot of copycats out there, and it's a great blueprint for success. And you see all, a lot of other companies you know, be very successful with that recipe. Yeah, and there's, there's a humanity to it and behind it. You know, one of the things I, I learned about you is I did a little research before the, the conversation is that mm -hmm. uh, you also are very much involved in youth. The community you know our future yeah, yes. the whole problem around will kids go back to school or not in the fall mm -hmm. is so much based on lack of medical knowledge but also a school system globally that's been thrown into the 21st century before they're ready and so talk a little bit if you would about Crispin's house because to me yeah. it really it's a long-term passion for you and yes. passion I think is what drives people to be successful at any number of things yeah, Crispin's House is something that is really near and dear to my heart, and I've been involved with it now, I think, for 15 years, I think, something like that. So um, 
the backstory here is my parents were both you know, fantastic role models for me and they were involved in my childhood where I was, there were scouts, sports, you know, school activities and things like that. So, you know, they really, I emulate them. I mean, I'm, I'm really doing what they did uh, when I was growing up. I came to know Christmas house through my father. So my father got involved with Christmas house um, back in the eighties and um I mean, the 90s, but, you know, it was a while ago, a long mm-hmm. time ago, you know, at least 25 years ago. So, um, you know, as, um, you know, I progressed through my adulthood and my, my kids started to get older and I started to get a little more free time. I, you know, he came to me and said, hey, what do you think about joining Christmas House and participating on the court diversion committee? And I'm like, yeah, sure, I'll give it a try. I knew what it was, but I had never done it before. And uh, the first time I, I had a committee hearing, I was hooked. So was, I absolutely loved it. Um, and I've continued to do it to this day. And it's, it's, I, I enjoy it so thoroughly because I feel like it really makes a difference in these kids' lives. You know, it gives, you, you know, as well as I do, every kid screws up. <laughs> you know, it's just a question if they get caught or not. You know, we've all done stupid things before. So these are the stupid kids that got caught. So, and we, we kind of jokingly say that to them all the time is, you know, it's like, hey, you know, we know that you did this, you got caught. So you broke the law. So let's, let's deal with that. And it turns out to be very much of a, a mentorship, parental, um, you know, you can be stern, you can be fair, you can be sympathetic, you know, all within the matter of minutes with these kids and really have a lot of latitude in finding ways to get through to them and getting your message to resonate with them about how they got to straighten their act out or they've got to stop doing this or stop hanging out with those kids. And the recidivism rate for that program is astronomically low. Um, and I'm one of many people on these committees, so it's certainly not you know, a testament to this me. But it's, it's so fulfilling, it's so rewarding to do it. I mean, I just, I, I love doing it and I have no intention of ever stopping doing it. And I suspect that that same attitude of learning, mentoring, sharing, you know, we all make mistakes and some are worse than others for some people, but the mentoring, sharing, it's kind of like a guidance for other people and, and it, it yeah. carries over into your professional life too. It does. I think lends to, as a startup founder, you know, the, the founders are the ones that set the tone, the culture. Mm-hmm. I felt that every day when I was down in Kendall Square and here you are opening up in Manchester, New Hampshire, which is exciting for all of us to know that we have an ecosystem that's growing here locally. So I guess I'll end this with just one final question to kick around because it's, mm-hmm. it's been, I, I kind of weave it in and out. This whole Communicast series started after we got locked down. I'm thinking, but this is how I always do business. So it's not unusual for me, but it yeah. may be for many others. And so the question is, since we have used these tools and you've got mentoring and from both the personal advocacy that you do that you're passionate about and the business advocacy, mm-hmm. can you think of one thing that surprised you when the shutdown happened in quarantine Something that is you didn't expect to impact you or the kids that you work with and advocate for or the business itself. A positive thing, because too many people talk about the things that didn't work. Right. But there's always some silver lining to it. Yeah, there was a silver lining for us. You know, I was, when this first happens, you know, as you had mentioned earlier, you know, I had just signed a lease on this office and literally six weeks later we were, I was looking at this office from afar for 90 days. It was really disheartening um, because it, you know, it, it really put a dent in our mojo, you know, what we had going on here at the company. So we, we had to reinvent ourselves. And when quarantine first started, I was, I was disheartened. I'm like, okay, this, you know, the rug just got pulled out from under us. And how do I, how do I keep the staff motivated? How do I keep myself motivated? You know, how do I keep that going? And what was, incredibly refreshing to see is every person on this team just absolutely doubled down on their commitment to mm. our success. And, you know, I kind of felt like, right, all right, I've got to be inspirational here and I've got to write these long Slack messages and really motivate people and say, listen, Hey, we're in this fight together. Like I, I, I that was, that was just me. Like, okay, is this what I'm supposed to do as a leader in a pandemic? You know, how do I keep my team engaged? And the reality is I didn't need to, they were right there. They were already there. And, you know, they remind me all the time of, you know, just the incredible work that they, they do just by them being people and caring about what they, they do and caring for each other. And I think if anything that, 
it, it, it was an opportunity for me to, you know, really take a step back and give people the opportunity to really show what they're all about. And it was refreshingly eye-opening to see people just like, no, nope, we got this, we got this, and we're with you, and we're with each other. So, you know, and I, I have this, I, I kind of, this phrase came out of the pandemic. I, I wrote it down accidentally one day, and it has stuck. And I say that, you know, our team is everything. Uh, without them, we are nothing. With them, we are everything. It's a powerful yeah. message and a powerful learning experience. You know, people stepped up. It's, it's it's a great lesson to be able to take forward from it. Well, it was, I a, hard thank you. It was a hard lesson, but it was hard, great. Yeah, <laughs> sure. You have everything planned out. You know how it works. You know stand up. All these things are ready to go in great new yep. space, and then bam, doors locked. Absolutely. <laughs> and there's nothing more demoralizing, you know, potentially. So to be able to come out of that and find that the team around you is as dedicated, you know, I've, I've seen it, I've experienced it in Cambridge, mostly translating to very long hours right. and the culture around that. But here, you've got to be creative and do it differently. And it, it just sounds like a fantastic, now that you can look back at it, it's a good feeling that you've got a team that's solid yes. with you. And that makes sense to carry that, as I look from a standpoint, community. You've got this community organization that's stronger than anything. You know, government alone, education alone, doesn't mm -hmm. do it. And no one individual can be successful under these conditions anymore. So pulling that it, together. I'm going to better myself. <laughs> yeah. So thank you for joining me. I really appreciate this. And, uh, My pleasure. Very exciting for you guys. Congratulations. It's, uh, it's a great listing. And you guys are going to be in Inc. Magazine in September. Yes, sir. So uh, yep. it's an exciting time. Thanks to all of them. And thanks to my team. That's they're the ones that made this possible. So uh, it's great. Congratulations all around. Thank you.